Um, hello and welcome back to the UCC Architecture Society Back to the Drawing Board lecture series. Um, today we're joined by myself, Leah Hurley, um, Claire Hannan and Martin O'Hurley from UCC Architecture Society and um, Sandra Campbell and Frank Turvey from uh, the RAI. So the RAI are the governing body of architects here in Ireland and they'll be discussing um, the process of becoming an architect and I suppose um, from education to the profession and then afterwards we'll be leading a discussion and any kind of questions that pop up um, we'll be asking them so enjoy. Good morning everyone good morning Claire, Martin, Neve and Frank thank you for having us and um, we're delighted to speak to you this morning and I'm just going to share my screen with the first presentation I'll start off speaking and then um, Frank will speak after me. So I'm going to talk about, give a brief introduction to the RAI, what, who we are, what we do, and how we might, you might interact with us over the years of your career. And then Frank will talk about um, the, the uh, being registered as an architect, what it means to be a professional, and uh, a bit about professional conduct. And that. So um, thank you very much, as I say, for having us. So, these are the points I'm going to cover in the presentation, who we are, what we do uh, as the RAI, the, the typical path to registration, some employment opportunities. We'll talk a little bit about completing your studies abroad, and then we'll speak about uh, support and engagement that the RAI can provide to you during your career. So who are we and what do we do? Well, the RAI are the professional body for architects in Ireland since 1859. We're the regulatory and support body for architects in Ireland under the Building Control Act 2007. And we are the competent authority for architecture in Ireland under the qualifications directive, the EU qualifications directive, um, which is the directive on recognition of professional qualifications. In terms of regulation and uh, competence, the RAI maintains the register of architects. So if you go to our website, you will see the register and you'll be able to look up to see if an architect is somebody who calls themselves an architect is registered. Um, we set the standards for architectural education and for practice, so maintenance of those standards throughout your career. Um, we develop and monitor continuing education, which is known as CPD, um, continuing professional development. Um, and we protect the public by ensuring architects meet the standards. And we provide architects with proof of their qualifications to enable them to work abroad. So that's in the whole, in the area of um, registration and regulation. And then we do a huge amount in the area of, I suppose, architecture itself and in education. Um, so we provide platforms for public engagement with architecture and architects via publications and competitions. So these are two examples of publications um, that we publish. The Architecture Ireland is the RAI journal, and that's issued to all members on a monthly, sorry, bi-monthly basis. Um, and it is currently uh, shared online only during COVID, and it's actually a very... Um, high quality publication and it, uh, the software that it's presented on is, is really is excellent. So it's a great opportunity if you are a student member of the OEI, you can get access to that publication online. We also produce house and design. Apologies for the fuzzy photograph, sure what happened there. <laughs> but um, that is uh, stocked in news agents throughout Ireland and it's also available in the OEI bookshop. But I'll talk a little bit about the bookshop in a few minutes. We, um, also have a number of online resources. So on the first image on the left represents the uh, RAI gallery. So the RAI run awards, which again, I'll talk about in a minute, but all of the, archi the archive of all the photographs of all the past awards is available on the RAI website under RAI galleries. So if you go to discover architecture on the RAI website, you'll find a range going back many years of, of, of photo very high quality photographs and descriptions of buildings. So if you're carrying out research for projects, it's, it's a good resource if you're not familiar with it already. We also produce a number of online resources for the public. So in the last couple of years, we produced the RAI Town and Village Toolkit, which is an excellent resource for um, um, people involved in and considering how towns can be best developed. And um, it's available online. And then we have Old House, New Home, which is a resource for members of the public who are um, living or considering purchasing um, historic properties as a home. And uh, it provides a huge amount of information on the type of advice you should get and um, 
you know, what kind of materials are out there. And it also shows a huge amount of uh, inspiration images of how uh, houses can be, or how properties can be converted into a, a new home from an old house. Um, we also can perform design reviews. So they provide platforms for public engagement with architecture. And they basically, um, we the RAI will appoint a, a panel of architects who, or assemble a panel of architects who have a competency in a particular area. And they look at a particular area of the country and um, they will work with the uh, public bodies in that area and with local interest groups to set out a vision for it. So again, I thought that these were areas that might be of particular interest to students if you've been working in on a particular city that you see, oh, there is a design review by the RII. Those, the, the, the content or the, the information is available on the RII website. And there's just an example of some past um, reviews that have uh, taken place. And you, you'd know the names of the architects who participate in these and they, they, they be very interesting in your, for research purposes. We also run the Simon Open Door, which is coming up again in the next few um, months. It'll be on in May and it'll be virtual again this year. It was virtual last year. It's a huge fundraising initiative by the RII with Simon. And if you're not aware of it, basically an architect gives an hour of their time to uh, advise a member of the public. The member of, public, of the public pays a fee, which is I think about 85 euros, certainly under 100 euros, I think. And um, that money all goes to Simon. And we've been doing it for since 2005. We've raised a, raised a massive amount of money with architects and, and members of the public. And it's a really good opportunity for, architect, for a member of the public who might not normally engage an architect to speak to an architect and to, to get a small bit of advice. I did it myself when I was in practice, and I have to say it was really good fun. I worked in a large practice, and we weren't... Uh, looking for clients and you know some, you know at that time we had we worked with big commercial clients but I just did it for the fun it was really enjoyable um, and obviously a good cause and then on the right hand side we have an image of the REI bookshop if you've never been in there you should pop in as soon as the COVID restrictions are uh, finished because it's a it's a fantastic array of books and also you can our, our bookshop manager Brona is always available if you want to put purchase a particular book or you want to get something in that she doesn't have, she'd be very happy to source it for you. Um, so the REI Bookshop is always a good uh, place to identify architecture books. Um, we also produce uh, policies on a wide range of um, topics relevant to the built environment. So some of them that might be interest to you, of interest to you at the moment are our um, policy on sustainability for the current global environmental crisis that was produced in 2019, primarily by our sustainability task force and the statement of policy on accessibility inclusion and universal design which i think is 2017 and then this one here designed and lasting design a lasting designing a lasting localized recovery um was produced in february 2021 so that's fresh off the press all those kind of policies and there's more of them i just couldn't fit them all in they are available on the policy section of the RAI website. So again, this is in the public area. There's a huge amount of this kind of information that might inform some of the work you're doing in college at the minute. When you join the RAI, then we have a, a members area, which is um, opens up and becomes available to you. And that has a huge amount of um, subcategories. These aren't all of them. I just took a screenshot of what I could fit. But we would we have a knowledge center. So when you click into one of these areas, you can search all the information that the RAI has, any practice notes that we send out to members on particular areas or any documentation that we produced or anything that we shared with our members from another organization that's relevant to uh, practice in that particular area. So there's a massive amount. Again, it's another, it's another huge research resource. You can join stu a student. You can join as a student member for free. And a lot of CCA members would be students. Um, so a few CCA students would be student members. And it is a great benefit if you're researching projects and you're looking for um, particular advice in a particular area. Um, so then we also support members lifelong learning. So I look after the CPD program with my colleagues in CPD and we develop new programs for members every year. Um, we also provide and um, now all our courses are available online. So we do a lot of blended learning, obviously, post COVID. We also record anything that we do do live and it's available online after in a video format. We run specialist accreditations, and that actually takes quite a lot of our time and resources, but it's a really worthwhile exercise because we allow uh, the opportunity for members with particular skills in conservation, PSDP, or environmental areas, sustainability, to um, showcase their skills to members of the public. So 
we run conservation accreditation. We have three grades. Grade three is the lowest grade, and then grade two and grade one. And with grade three, you do a you normally the normal route would be to do a course, um, a five day course, and then an exam, which is running at the moment. And then for grade two and grade one, you would have to have building dossiers where you've actually got experience and you've worked on a project, conservation projects, uh, sorry, five conservation projects, and you then go for assessment of those dossiers and you're interviewed. So it's quite a uh, um, um, I suppose it, it's a process that takes quite a lot of effort for members, but it really does pay off when they have that accreditation because they're recognised as specialists in the area. We also um, have a system called MyORIA CPD, which allows members to record their CPD points each year. And the requirement for a um, an ORI member is to complete 40 CPD points each year, and at least 20 of those must be structured. So something like this, an online presentation or a course in classroom, or it could be a college um, course. But if you're a student or graduate member, you don't have a CPD requirement. So that doesn't kick in until you're actually registered. But you can use the system. Certainly as a graduate, you can use the system. Not actually, I don't think students can, but graduates can. Um, so then one of our big parts, sorry for a very busy slide, but one of the things we do is in, in the education area is a credit qualification. So you might be aware and you might have come across the RAI visiting the School of Architecture in Cork and carrying out an evaluation of the uh, BSc and MArc. Um, the last one happened in 2017 and 2018, and it will be due to be accredited again, I think, in 2023. So... Um, the qualifications in qualifications in architecture are accredited on the basis of five years of architectural education. That's really important because I know in Cork you do a four year qualification and then you do a one year master's. But actually, we we count that as a full five years. We don't actually look at it split, I suppose, because you have to have five years of recognised architectural education in order to proceed on to do the professional practice exam and to join the register. So you, we, we will talk about the whole package generally. So the following qualifications are accredited and prescribed accredited by the RAI and prescribed in the Building Control Act. Um, the MARC at CCAE, the BARC in TU, in TU Dublin, Dublin School of Architecture, the uh, MARC at UCD, the BARC at uh, UL, the BARC at WIT, and then the MARC at TU Dublin is currently under eval evaluation for accreditation. So they've had their second visit. They had a visit in April, they had a visit this week, second visit this week, and now the final visiting board report will go to the Board of Architecture Education in the next couple of weeks, and they will find out whether they their qualification is accredited or not. So that's the process, and this, a similar process would have happened for CCAE when the programme was first introduced. And then the BARC at IT Sligo has provisional approval, that's a five-year accreditation, so a visiting board is visiting each year until the first cohort graduate, which will be in 2023. Um, so the following professional practice exams are accredited for admission to the Register of Architects and ORI membership, the Professional Diploma in Architecture at UCD and the Professional Diploma in Architectural Practice at TU Dublin. And as you probably know, you would complete your five years of architecture education at CCAE or elsewhere, and then you'll do two years of professional experience, and then you'll do the professional practice exam. And those are the two professional practice exam. People call them the part three, but that's a UK term. We call them the professional practice exam. So you'll hear us use that term quite a lot. So again, I described there about the most common pathway to registration is for um, you to achieve a degree from a recognised school, a five-year degree, to complete 24 months of professional experience in a, in a, or with a registered architect as your mentor, um, and then complete a professional practice diploma or PPE exam, and then apply to the Register of Architects and become a registered architect. Architect. And we would say that if you're considering taking an alternative path to registration as an architect, you should talk to the RAI first. This is the route that most of you started on. And if you're not going to complete on it for any reason, maybe just have a word with myself or Frank in the future. Um, and then I just talk about employment opportunities. So this is the job search section of the RAI website. Uh, anybody can view it. You don't have to be a member. But there are actually this list here. You have to be a student member to access it and we what we do is we refresh that list each year so RAI practices that are interested in hiring year out students will let us know and we will um, post their their company details on a, a list so if you become a student member you can log in and you can have a look at that and you can inquire um, from the practice to see whether they'd like to take because I know a lot of you will be think, taking the year out now over the next 12 months um, and then I thought I'd highlight we, we list graduate positions and if student positions arise they're listed there so you can see there's a graduate position down here there's two here and these I'll talk about now they are the um, graduate training schemes so the about 20 years ago more and more the RAI set up 
the first graduate training scheme with the RAI, with the sorry OPW, and it the training scheme is a way for students to, or sorry, graduates to move through the, the 24 months of um, experience in a structured way, in a cohort of, of people, of graduates who are working together in one organization. It gives them, I suppose it's a bit like, um, it gives them more structure than it does if you're in a practice on your own and you're the only person who's working towards a professional practice exam and you're doing your lectures. You would normally hook up with other people from college if you can, which is what I did. But I had a friend who was in this scheme at the time and watching the way that she moved through it was really interesting because um you know there, there's you're all focused together on making sure you get the right experience you're coming back from lectures and you're talking together about how you're applying what you learned to your job and the other thing that's interesting is it actually extends over three years rather than two years so you spread out the the uh, experience uh, and the process a bit more and it gives you a bit more time to come to terms with what you're learning and also to um gain the experience in all the different areas that you need to in order to do the professional practice exam or diploma. So the current schemes that are running are at the OPW, Department of Education and Skills, Cork City Council, Mayo County Council, and a new one at the Housing Agency. And I would recommend that if you know anybody who's in who's qualified recently uh, from the MRC or has done five years of artificial education and is looking for work, that they point maybe point them towards these because they're there on the website at the minute. The closing date is the 12th of March. And they're a really great opportunity to, um, to to move into a structured scheme like that. Obviously, you're paid. You know, there's a salary, um, and it's, it's quite a um, a good salary in terms, of, I would say, of a graduate a graduate rate. Um, so this is the complicated slide that I mentioned earlier. And if you one one of the questions when when we get deliver these presentations, a lot of questions arise in the area of moving abroad to complete your studies. And it's always been kind of complicated for various reasons. And in a way, it's kind of simplified a little bit recently because the UK left the EU because their system is quite different to the systems of um, architecture education in other states, EU member states. So I'm going to first focus on the EU. And a lot of people, we've had a lot of queries, particularly actually from CC, people in CCAE, who are thinking of moving to other EU states to complete their architecture education after they finish their MARC. So if you consider complete, if you're thinking of going to another EU member state, it's important to understand that um, all qualifications in architecture are uh, have to meet Article 46 in Europe, sorry, have to meet Article 46 of the European Directive on Mutual Recognition of Qualifications, which I mentioned earlier. And while there's a minimum, a common minimum standard for architects in the EU, individual member states have their own standards and requirements above and beyond this. So most member states have a two-stage process similar to ourselves. The academic phase, which for us would be the five years of architecture education based on accreditation or prescription of the final degree. And then a period of professional training, usually described as the professional practice experience. And then some qualifications may include more than one award, for example, a BSc, followed by a BRC or an MRC, which is the case in CCAE. However, only the fire high, final higher qualification, BRC or MRC, is accredited and prescribed for access to the profession. So if you move from an Irish education institution to another education institution within the EU or the EEA, um, which is uh, the Nordic States, before completing the final award after five years, the education institution that you move to is responsible to ensure that you will, at the point of graduation, meet the minimum standards for prescribed architectural qualification nationally and EU level, at EU level. So that means you have, if you go to, say, I know people are looking at Sweden, and places like that. so say you went to a, a school in Sweden, the first thing you need to do is ask them, is their qualification recognized under uh, the European Directive on Mutual Recognition of Professional Qualifications? You have to ensure that the award that you're going to get is listed in the directive. And you need to ask the school that, and you need confirmation in writing that it is listed. But we would also recommend that you contact the competent authority in that state, which is, we're the, we're the competent authority in Ireland, and you should contact the equivalent competent authority in that state. Um, and you need to confirm that. We have heard instances where somebody has signed up for a pro programme, received an MRC, and in fact, it wasn't actually the MRC that was listed in the directive, and they completed the course, and that they then had to go back and try and resolve that with the university. So it is your responsibility to check that. Um, the second thing is that you need to ask them to confirm that you will achieve the full standard in, listed in Article 46 of the directive when you qualify after five years, and they need to confirm that in writing to you. So that's your responsibility. Um, and the third thing is then in some states, there isn't registration. So 
for example, Sweden um, and Denmark, the, the, the qualification isn't, uh, you don't have to be registered to, to act to provide services. What they do instead is they have a requirement that you have so many years, if you're practicing in that state, you have a requirement that you have to have so many years of experience to work on particular types of buildings. But if you qualify with an EMARC from Sweden, you can potentially come back to the to you've you've essentially achieved all the requirements for um, practice in that state, or sorry, recognition in that state, I should say, and you can return to Ireland and join the register immediately. Now we would, I suppose, um, strike a note of caution there that you, if you come back and you complete an EMARC and you join the register in the RAI, we would strongly advise that you complete at least the lecture series of, a, of the professional practice exam, one of the diplomas, because you will have missed a certain amount of professional training and familiarization with legislation in Ireland that um, is, is essential to practice as an architect. So we really advise that you do, you know, we strike, we would make a point of um, caution there that you do ensure that you are competent when you start to practice and that you familiarize yourself in those areas. If you have further questions about that, you're very welcome to contact us and we can talk about it. I'll just ask Frank, do you want to add anything on that, Frank? Are you? Um, you know, just as you said, if you do go to one of the countries where they don't have a professional practice exam and you come back to Ireland to practice or to register, that it is probably a good idea to familiarize yourself with Irish building regulations, uh, contract administration and so on before you start uh, practicing uh, and the best way to do that is actually through sitting the, the professional practice uh, lecture series or even doing the whole course doing the examinations and stuff as well yeah absolutely okay and frank will talk more about um what it means to be professional and you know maintaining your um, reputation and that in his presentation and that will reinforce what we're talking about here. So I'll just move on then on to recognition in the UK. So you might have heard, some of you might have heard if you have your ears close to the ground, that there is a, there was an MOU recently uh, developed between the RAI and the Architects Registration Board in the UK. So they've designed a memorandum of understanding facilitating the ongoing mutual recognition of architecture qualifications. The agreement between the two bodies ensures that architects trained in either Ireland or the UK can continue to register in the other jurisdiction without the need to undertake additional measures. So that, but that really applies to people who are already on the register of architects. So whether they were on the register, you might have been, um, you might have started your education in Ireland and moved to the UK, done the part three, joined the register in the UK and you're Irish and you want to be able to practice in Ireland and you can benefit from um, the MOU. But it's it's not, doesn't, I'm just saying however here, because it doesn't really apply to students present. If you're in fourth year, you're thinking of moving to the UK to consider your part, to, to complete your part two, you do need to be careful and I'll tell you why. So Irish programs like um, others in the EU are recognized on the basis of five years of study, as I said. The UK alone breaks the five years of study into two elements referred to as the part one and part two. And moving from the UK to, from Ireland to the UK to take a part two will mean that the UK authorities, as in the Architects Registration Board, will only confirm the status of your UK part two if they have also assessed the earlier phase of your studies in Ireland against their standards. So in other words, if you decide to move to a UK part two, you may inquire with the school in the UK and they are they should tell you that your first four years aren't recognized in the UK and they can't be recognized in the UK until the ARB assess them. Sometimes they do tell. We've heard here experience that sometimes they don't tell the students this. So the students can end up signing up for a part two. They carry on, they then sign up for a part three and they do the part three in the UK. And then they go to register and the ARB say, where's your part one? And you say, well, I did four years in CCAE. And they say, but that's not recognized by the ARB. So therefore you have to do, you have to attend the ARB for an interview assessment. And you have to bring your portfolio of work that you did in your first four years. And you have to, and this could be six, seven years later, you have to go back and sit and describe what you did in CCAE in the first four years of education. And you have to pay up to, at the moment, I think, or sorry, in 2017, I think that was, it's 1,600 uh, sterling. Now that may have increased or it may increase by the time you got to that point. So it's, a, it's quite onerous 
And so you need to be aware if you do move to the UK in the middle of your five years of education that there are implications. And if you hear of anything, anybody thinking of moving to the UK in the middle of their five years, please ask them to contact us and we can help advise them on, on um, the best way forward. But, you know, it is important to bear in mind that you can move. A lot of programmes now in architecture in Ireland are considering a four plus one model similar to CCA. A lot of them are in a three plus two and they're all kind of moving, particularly probably because the longer you're in and be in, in your first degree, the more you can avail of um, free fees. So TU Dublin are introducing their MARC. And if that becomes accredited, that's an option for students in CCA. UCD may also be able to accommodate you. Any of the schools may be able to take you into their BARC either. So WIT or UL. So if you want to move, do have a look at the Irish schools first. Have a look at the EU. And if you're looking at the UK, just have a chat with us. I see Frank has turned on his microphone, so he might want to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say, obviously, the EU is a big place and there's lots of other countries there now that you can choose from. And they have international masters and they teach courses through English. So yeah. if you look at those courses that are in English, that you could go to Holland or Sweden or Germany. Um, yeah. But you just need to make sure that the course is listed in the directive. You need to check that with the school and the, the competent authority in that country before you move. Yeah, and actually, Frank had a very good idea recently that we should try to... Uh, compile a list of um, European qualifications that are delivered in English. And I got one at a recent meeting so far. So there's one in Finland, Finland, I know. Now there are more, I know, in the Nordic states and you're probably aware of them, but we will try to, if you come across more, maybe let us know and we'll add to it and we'll try to host it on the website and we'll try to talk about it at these presentations so that you have an idea of where the options are. But um, it would be great, you know, it's a great opportunity to look further and to, to, to gain experience of a different country. Um, so that's, I think they're the main points on completing your studies. And if you have questions, maybe we could talk about them at the end. I just thought I would put up the statement of policy in architectural education here because that's something it was reviewed in 2016 and it's due to be reviewed again. But it sets out the um, all the if you're wondering why we require 24 months of architecture of, of experience after the five years, why do we, you know, in the UK, there's a year recognized in the middle of the, that experience is recognized. In, if you if you take a year out, it can be recognized towards your um, professional experience prior to registration. This policy sets out all those things and it is reviewed on a regular basis. And when we're reviewing it again, we'll be looking for students and graduates to get involved in that process. So it'd be great that you, if you're aware of it and if you have queries and you're interested in this area, we'd love to hear from you and we would love to um, uh, include you in that discussion. But that's on the REI website and I've put the link in the notes at the end of this presentation. So we uh, constantly engage with students and schools of architecture in the REI and we um, a few years ago helped set up the Architecture Students Association of Ireland. This is their inaugural event and this it was in 2018 at Student Mixer. A lot of people travelled for that. It was really um, popular. It was great fun and I think they had a good night out after Frank and I <laughs> went home. But uh, it it has kind of, we found struggled over it during Covid as everybody has struggled to keep contact with students and we are talking to the schools of architecture about whether there's another way to to keep that going and whether it was suggested that maybe the class rep system might be a good way to keep contact with the RAI because it's really important that we have particularly a student on the board of architecture education that there's a voice for students in the decisions that are being made about architectural education so if you're interested in getting involved please let us know if your society is interested in in kind of um helping that to to get moving again it would be fantastic um the RAI, we have eight accreditation visits to programmes in architecture and architectural technology to take place this year. I mentioned there's one at the moment happening at TU Dublin. The others were um, postponed until post-COVID, but we will be carrying uh, out accreditation visits again in October. And a number of schools will see us pop in, our visiting boards come in, and they're a panel of, of um, people with experience of architecture education or are practising architects. And they look at the programme and make sure that it and the work of the students is meeting the standard. Um, we have a biannual meeting with the heads of schools of architecture, which is a great opportunity in the, to, to talk about informally about the things that are happening and the challenges that, that students and schools are seeing. Um, and we have now will have, as of next month, we'll have nominees of each of the schools of architecture on the RAI Board of Architecture Education. So we're really looking forward to that. We used to have one nominee from all this, representing all the schools, but now we're going to have one from each school. So there'll be a much closer alignment with the schools and hopefully you'll hear more back in, sorry, college about um, what the REI are doing and things that are happening that are, are impacting on your education. 
We have an architectural education representative on the RAI Council, which is fantastic as well. That's usually somebody who's lecturing in architecture. So uh, John McLaughlin was on council. I don't think he still is, but he was he had been very closely involved for a number of years and would still have a lot of contact with us. We have student participation in the RAI annual, annual conference. We always allow we have a sponsor that um, supports students to attend for 10 euro but actually the last conference online there in november was free and there were a few thousand people at it a really interesting session and i i understand they're trying to do the same thing again this year so do keep an eye out that's going to be in i think it's the end of october or is it start of october anyway um sorry i should have the date there but it will be a really good opportunity and i might send on the date to you after Neve. and then um we have an architecture and education section in our, in Architecture Ireland, our journal. So if there's anything that you would like to feature in the journal, do let us know. Our uh, communications director, um, Sandra O'Connell, would be very happy to talk to you. So I'll just talk a little bit about the RAI Student Awards, the annual awards that we run every year. We run four awards, um, the RAI Scott Talon Walker Student Excellence Award in Architecture, the Rising Star in Architecture for Architectural Technology, the Student Award for Sustainable Design, and the Ar um, Architecture Ireland uh, Student Writing Prize. And last year, each year, these prizes are presented at the RAI conference in the RDS, but last year the RAI conference took place online so there's a great video here of the um, Rising Star Awards, which are awards for young architects who's just starting out in practice, and then also the student awards. And it's a, it's a really interesting video and it's re good, great exposure for you if you um, win or, or are runner up in one of these awards. So um, you're welcome to have a quick look at that there. I won't go through it now. But um, the Scott Talon Walker Student Excellence Award in Architecture is open to students currently in fifth year, final thesis year, so in CCA, that would be the MARC of programmes in Ireland. And it, you're asked to submit an A1 board or equivalent size A1 um, in soft copy. It's illustrating the work carried out during your fifth year. There's a prize up to 5,000 euro and that can be awarded at the discretion of the jury. And you would be, as I say, the, if you're for, particularly for the Scott Talon Walker Award, those who are um, selected um, uh, sorry, finalists, sorry, are asked to give a short presentation at the RAI conference and their work is exhibited at the conference physically. So it's, it's a great way to, to get your name out there amongst practices. And often you find at the end of the presentation, you see architects running up to the side of the stage and offering their card to, the, to those who are highly commended or the winner to try and uh, get them into the practice. So, you know, it, it puts yourself, puts your work out there and um, lets people know what you're good at. So the submission is from mid-September 2021, and we accept them from June. That's really, we accept them for school, school, for schools of architecture who finish in June, they can submit their work then. But for the likes of CCE, where you submit in September, um, you will then, just shortly after you submit your thesis, you would want to be ready to submit your A1 board. The registration forms will be available shortly, and I've listed some of the recent winners there. So you can see last year, you owned Smith from UCD1, and 2017 and 2016, there were two winners from CCAE. The RAI Student Award for Sustainable Design is open to students of recognised programmes in architecture in Ireland and of RAI accredited programmes in architectural technology. So essentially, it's open to all RAI accredited courses and it's also open to Queen's and, and QUB, so students from those schools can join too. Um, the prize fund is awarded at the discretion of the jury. I'm sorry, I should say that, that eligibility applies to all of these four awards. Anybody from Queen's or uh, QUB can, can enter them. Again, you submit in mid-June and the registration form will be available shortly and there's the winners from the last few years, all to you, Dublin, so we need a few CCAE people in there. Um, the Irish uh, Architecture Ireland Student Writing Prize is open again to the same students from any year in architecture or architectural technology and the prize fund is awarded at the discretion of the jury and you submit in mid-June, the registration form will be available shortly and you can see that there was a winner from CCAE in 2016 and last year's was Gary Hamilton from UCD. Um, in terms of support and engagement as well, we have the student membership, which I've mentioned a few times during the presentation. That's free to join with no annual charge or admissions fee. And you do get access to the REI e e news, uh, member e-newsletter, which is issued about once a week and connect, it, it informs members about all sorts of issues to do with practice. Um, and also about events coming up, think free events that might be available, uh, competitions, all that type of stuff. So it's well worth uh, keeping an eye on. We would, you then get access as well to the member section of the RI website. And I talked about the Knowledge Centre and all the research that's available in there and policies and, and all that would be available to you. The RI Good Practice Guide was updated re recently. 
and you can get a discount subscription to that as a student member, but you can get free access as a graduate member. And it's worth knowing that that actually sets out um, the process that's followed in an office in each stage of a project. So when I started in practice, I had it in hard copy beside my desk and I'd open and go, okay, what am I expected? It sets out each the role of each person. So you could be um, an architectural graduate on a project, you could be the, the architect, you could be um, the associate director, say it's in, in charge of a number of project, or you could coach or you could be the managing director of the company or the um, administrative assistant. And each of those roles are described at each stage from, um, you know, meeting the client first, developing the brief, planning, um, tender, uh, and then on site, what your role is at each point. Frank talks about it, we'll talk about it a bit further in his presentation, and it's a really important document and really useful when you're setting out you know, into practice. Architecture Ireland Online, the publication is also available, as I mentioned earlier. We can also provide um, advice on employment, careers and access to the register and on working abroad. And you can participate in the student writing prizes as a member and you get subsidised attendance at the annual conference, uh, which is going to take place on the 2nd and 3rd of November 2021. But in fact, last year's attendance was free for students and we hope that it will be again this year. Um, and then uh, anybody who is a student of architecture or architectural technology, or enrolled in a year, who are enrolled in or on a year out from courses accredited by the RAI. So you could be again from Queen's or from QUB and, and join as an RAI student member. So if you want to join a student member, contact membership at RAI or admissions at RAI.ie. Sorry, I would recommend admissions in the first instance. And, and then talk very briefly about graduate membership. There, this is the charge. We reduced it a lot over the last few years. So it's a 55 euro annual charge used to be 135. And there's a one-stop admissions fee of 25, which used to be 145. Um, and it's um, that's for eligible, that fee is for eligible graduates who apply within 12 months of qualification. Uh, and you get all of those benefits that were listed in the student membership, but you also get free subscription to the updated RIA Good Practice Guide, which is really important when you're doing your professional practice exam. Uh, and there's one last thing I wanted to mention. You might have heard, hopefully, Jerry has been on circulated notice of the um, free mental health and wellbeing workshops that are being supported by the Irish Benevolence, Artists Benevolence Society. This society is running for a long number of years and it supports architects and their families in, who in there are uh, experiencing hardship. But they have felt that one area that they could really help at the moment during COVID is to support students who are um, struggling during this current crisis and are working from are studying from home on their own and isolated and um, you know, you're not getting out to see your friends in the same way that you would and you're under pressure to try and get your projects finished. And you're very, very welcome to join the next session, which is scheduled for Thursday, the 25th of March from 3 to 5 p.m. We'd really encourage you to take part. It's small groups of people, maximum of about 20 to 25. You'd be broken up into smaller groups and you know, in, in breakout groups. And if you're going to talk to somebody about anything, it would be in a very small group. But it's the, the feedback has been really positive. We ran them for our own members in March last year, or May actually last year, and I participated myself and was in a breakout room with a number of artists. And it was really interesting to hear what people said and just to see that people are going through the same things as you. It's it's um, facilitated by a qualified psychologist. So if you're, um, he's excellent, I have to say, the guy, John Broderick. So if you're interested, please do uh, sign up for it. Or if you think any of your fe fellow um, students might be interested, let them know. Uh, you just email cpd at rii.ie to, to grab the place. If it gets booked out, they'll try and support more events. So don't worry if you miss that date. Okay, that's, I think that's everything. So if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. So, yeah, so my name is Frank Turvey and I'm the Registrar for Architects. So Sandra's spoken to you about studying and becoming an architect and what you need to do to get to the register, I guess. And what I'm going to talk to you now about is what happens once you get there. Um, so as Sandra said, the RAI has been around for a long time, since 1839, and originally it was set up as a support and representative body for architects. But since 2008 um, and the introduction of the Building Control Act, it's also the registration body and the competent authority. So, um, and so it established the register in 2008. Um, and I guess the purpose of the register and uh, the protection of title of the title architect is, is to protect the public. Um, but the Building Control Act also is there to facilitate kind of mobility around the European Union by all everybody working to the same standard. So everybody is qualified to the same standard. So all your qualifications are recognized uh, and the Building Control Act uh, helps the mobility by recognizing qualifications. Um, so where are you? 
Uh, so the next slide, so yeah, just a brief history. So prior to 2007, there was, uh, anybody could call themselves an architect. There was nothing to stop somebody from going out and saying they're an architect. Um, but uh, since the act came in, the title has been protected. As I said just there a second ago, the EU directives were, were transposed into Irish law in the Building Control Act. And those EU directives were there to facilitate the freedom of establishment, the freedom to provide services in other member states based on mutual recognition of your qualifications in architecture. And architecture is a very special privileged position. This there's only seven professions which benefit from what's known as automatic recognition. That's like doctors, nurses, vets, pharmacists, architects. There's one or two others. I can't remember what they are, but architecture has this very um, kind of privileged pos uh, position. Um, so as I said, so architecture, so registration started on the 6th of November, 2009. It's there to protect the consumer in the built environment, um, the, the act is. Um, there's protection of title in the Act, and it's set up a lot of statutory procedures and things like the Professional Conduct Committee, which I'll talk about later on, um, and also, as I mentioned already, automatic recognition in other, in other member states. Um, but the Act doesn't protect the function of an architect, so the only thing that's protected by the Act is the title architect. So only people on the register can use the title. So just to give you a few stats, there's about 3,300 3, architect, architects in Ireland at the moment. Um, and if you compare that to the UK, there's 44,000 architects in the UK. So it gives you an idea of the, um, the number of architects that you get in society. So the first thing I guess is to talk about the registrar of architects. Um, so, so this is me, so this is my role. So I'm the registrar, so what do I do? Well, my job is to keep the, keep the register. And by keeping the register, what I do is I make sure that everybody who enters the register is eligible. So they've all got their qualifications, they've all done their professional practice exam. Um, every year, I make sure that people have done their continuing professional development. Um, they then have to pay their annual charge to remain on the register. Once they pay their annual charge, they get issued a practicing certificate. And when they get issued the practicing certificate, that has to be displayed in the place of work. So when you go into a dentist's surgery or a doctor's surgery or into your local pharmacist, you'll always see on the wall their practicing certificate. That's the same with an architect. You're all doing the same thing. You're all registered professionals. You all have to have your practicing certificate up on the wall where you practice so that people know that you're a registered professional and that you're signed up to a code of conduct. And if you do something wrong, um, you can be reported to your, to your registration body and they can have a hold an inquiry uh, to see uh, whether or not you've followed the correct procedures or rules in a certain situation. So as you see on that slide there, uh, so route A1 is what the route to registration that all you guys would be doing. It's the most straightforward route. It's doing your five years um, of your qualification, which is all generally about the theory. And then you do your two years of your professional practice course, which is all about professional practice and learning what it means to practice and the obligations of professionals to society and things like that. Um, and then again, very important, as I said, in CPD, Every year, you need to make sure you've got your 40 hours of CPD, as Sandra said earlier on. So why do we need the register? Well, I guess there's two broad reasons why we need a register for architects or registers generally for professionals. One is to protect the public, um, and the other is to protect the integrity of the profession. So I said already, like all the professions generally have, have, um, have a register. So there's a role of solicitors. You have the register for medical practitioners, you've got the registers for dentists, nurses, vets, midwives, teachers, quantity surveyors, building surveyors. They're all registered professions and they're all required to meet certain standards of education and professional practice. Um, so as we see there, so to protect the public and the integrity of the profession by setting the standards of entry to, to the profession. So that's Article 46, the Professional Qualifications Directive, which sets out a common standard across Europe that architects have to reach and in Ireland, that's also reflected in the RIAI education policy and in the QQI standard for architecture. Um, and of course, education doesn't just stop once you finish college. As I said already, every year things change and you need to maintain your knowledge, skill and competence. And that's where CPD comes in. Um, the RIAI also provides uh, practice bulletins and uh, practice notes to the profession telling them what the accepted standard is in a certain situation. And by following these procedures, you'll always know that you're kind of doing the right thing. You haven't fallen below the expected standard. 
And that comes into play later on when we start talking about the PCC and uh, poor professional performance and professional misconduct. So long as you can show that you've uh, acted in accordance with the guidance from your professional body, you'll generally be held to have done the correct thing. Um, and so, yeah, so by protect and all these things together protect the public, public because your monitoring standards, by monitoring standards, harm is likely to occur to the public. Uh, and then also disciplinary measures are in place. So that helps kind of normalize things. If people see what's right and what's wrong through the outcome of disciplinary procedures, um, it means that people are going to kind of, uh, there'll be a normalization standard. People realize what's right and what's, what's acceptable and what isn't. Um, so we're now going to get into kind of the nitty gritty. So the Building Control Act established a number of um, boards which are required to kind of regulate the profession to a degree. So hopefully you'll only ever have to deal with one of these boards and that board is the admissions board. So when you finish college and you finish your professional practice exam, you'll come up to the RIAI with your diplomas all stamped and all the rest of it. And it'll go into the admissions board. The admissions board will sit down, they'll review your qualification, they'll check it against the Bill of Control Action Directive and make sure that it fits into one of those categories. And uh, you'll go through what's known as route A1. The Technical Assessment Board is a board uh, that you don't need to know about, so I won't go into that now. Uh, the Professional Conduct Committee is where are the people who deal with complaints against professionals. So if a client or a contractor or somebody believes that an architect has acted uh, unprofessionally or in breach of the code of conduct or the standard expected of them has fallen below that required standard, um, they can be referred to the Professional Conduct Committee. Um, and then the appeals board. So if the outcome of the professional conduct committee uh, uh, can be, well, the outcome of the professional conduct committee can be challenged and can be brought to the appeals board. And then if the appeals board decision is, uh, doesn't meet somebody's expectations, they can appeal that to the high court. Um, but I'll talk about those committees again. I'll talk about the professional conduct committee later on as we go through. So what does it actually mean to be a professional? So we're all here studying and uh, one day we're going to be working out there, but what makes me as a professional different to somebody else who's working? So there's kind of basically four kind of characteristics. There's lots of ways that this is described. And I'll go through two of them now, but these are kind of two nice kind of clean explanations. One is the nature of the work. So the nature of the work for of a professional is generally a skills and specialized kind of work. It's more of a mental uh, work than the manual work and you're trained in the theory and practice of what it is that you're doing. The second thing is that there's, the nature of it is that there's a collective organization. So there's a group of people who get together, establish the standard, hold examinations, and everybody in this group agrees to abide by a certain code of conduct. So in the case of architects, I guess it's the fact that there's the RIAI, there's a professional conduct committee, everybody's studying and on an agreed course and so on, and they're all gonna reach the same kind of standard. The third thing is the status. So today, the status is kind of uh, given by the act of the Eroctus. It's given in the Building Control Act that you're a professional and you got to do certain things. In the past, it might've been through just society and so on. So it might've been things like medicine, law, architects, engineers, and so on. Just the status that they held in society meant that they were actually uh, deemed to be a professional. Um, but it's the fact that you have a special set of skills that people who haven't trained in this area don't have. Um, they're hard to acquire. They're not used very often in life. And so when a member of the public needs this skill, they have to hire somebody who's a professional and they have to put their whole trust in that professional. And that professional has to deliver um, the service um, to a high standard. And then there's a moral aspect of the profession. So it's more than just been honesty. There's also kind of things like confidentiality, uh, committing to maintaining high training standards. So again, things like CPD, is, and you have a duty to society that transcends just your duty to the client. There's a greater, greater kind of calling. There's a commitment to, to the greater good. There's like, it's a vocation, you know, it's a calling. There's, it's more than just serving the client, it's serving your community and everything else and society and everything that goes with that. So as I said, as a net professional, you're an expert in an area and that an everyday person will not use on a daily basis. So they're hiring you for your expertise and your knowledge and your skill and they're relying on you and you, they have to trust you and they need to have confidence in you and they expect the highest standard from you and you must deliver on these standards. And that's what it is to be a professional. So 
to say here, so professionals, this is just another definition. So a profession is an occupation in which a trained individual uses an intellectual skill based on an established body of knowledge and practice to provide a specialized service in a defined area, exercising independent judgment in accordance with the code of ethics in the public interest. So as I said, there's lots of different kinds of definitions, but this one is quite good. And it highlights certain things. You've got a special skill. There's an element of trust, independence. You've got to maintain your, in, your independence. You've got moral duties to the client and to the community. And you're giving a service to a public who's less knowledgeable than you are in a specialist or a complex area. Um, and the big thing here is that it's your reputation that gives you value. So you're trading on your reputation. And as you all know, we only have one reputation in life. And if you lose that reputation, it's very hard to get it back and to build and carry on your career again. So as an architect, you've got to be very careful that you don't impair your reputation or give it away cheaply or lose it by doing something that you, you regret doing. So the classic example of this is <clears throat> you're working with a builder or a contractor and the contractor is saying, listen, I'm going on holidays next week. Can you certify the staircase for payment? Because I need the money. I haven't put it in yet, but I'll put it in when I come back from my holidays. And you go, oh yeah, Jimmy, that's grand. I'll do that. And so you certify the staircase. The client has to pay for it. Jimmy goes off on holidays and never comes back. And now you've compromised yourself. And that's not something you should ever do. Don't certify stuff you haven't looked at. Don't certify things that you don't know about. Don't put your colleagues in that position either. Don't ask them to do something that you wouldn't do either, OK? So as I said, it's your reputation. You've only got one of it. Hold on to it. Don't lose it. And if something feels wrong, generally it is wrong. So ask somebody else and, and just to confirm it. But as I said, you've won reputation. Don't lose it, don't ruin it um, because it's very important to your career. Um, so what else is there? Yeah, okay. So the duty of an architect. So this is a very good thing. If you can remember these four things, um, they'll help you in your career. And these come from a book called Building in the Law um, by David Keane. I think it's still on the course for some courses, I'm not sure, but it should be in your library. But it just says that the duty of an architect is to secure a design which is skillful, effective to achieve its purpose within any financial limitations imposed or made known and comprehensive in the sense that no necessary or foreseeable work is omitted. Uh, to secure the obtaining of a competitive price for the work from a competent contractor and the placing of the contract accordingly in terms which afford reasonable protection to the employer's interests, both in regard to price and the quality of the work. To secure efficient inspection, to ensure that the works are carried out, that as carried out conform in detail to the design. And to secure efficient administration of the contract so as to achieve speedy and economical completion of the contract. So these are important things to remember. A surgeon is never going to guarantee that they are going to cure you. And a solicitor is never going to guarantee that they're going to win your case. But what these people will do is they'll guarantee that they'll use all their reasonable skill, care, and diligence in an attempt to achieve the desired result. And that's what you need to remember is that you can't guarantee success to your clients, but what you will be able to do and what you can guarantee them is that you'll, you, you will use all your reasonable skill, care, and diligence in attempting to get a solution to their problem. So you never over guarantee, never say, I'll definitely be able to do this for you. So you've got to manage your client's expectations. Um, there's an expectation and kind of, and sorry, the biggest cause of complaints is kind of this expectation and delivery gap. So the client is expecting something. For some reason, the architect has, has kind of given the impression that, yeah, we can definitely do this. But then something comes up, something that's uncontrollable, something to do with the ground, groundworks, something else, some products shrinking or expanding or whatever, things that are beyond your control. Um, and that often leads to a complaint because the architect has promised perfection. Whereas we know building, a building doesn't come out of a factory. It's not perfect. Things are always going to change and move throughout the process. So, and there's another quote here, which is that uh, a building is an attempt, building is an attempt to place an untested handcrafted cube of uh, made of materials which expand, contract, shrink, creep and warp unilaterally onto foundations laid in mosaic of erratic geological condi conditions owing to its nature of the caprice of the ancient ice. It can never be the tested product of a laboratory and legislation governing, well, it goes on about talking about legislation of uh, defective products and so on, but that's what it is. You're dealing with a lot of uncontrollables. 
So never overpromise. So another thing that you then have to be have to realize throughout your career is managing the risk. So it's very important that you're always insured. You always have your professional uh, indemnity and cover in place. So there is liability arises in two ways for architects. It lies, it lies in a breach of contract and it can uh, arise in tort, which is negligence where you breach a duty of care. So you always have to show that you've taken reasonable care and avoided any kind of uh, foreseeable kind of damage that can happen. And one of the best ways, as I mentioned already about this, is to show that you're following the customary practice. You've been up to date with your practice notes. You follow the advice in the good practice guide. Uh, your CPD is up to date. These are all ways of showing that you're adhering to the customary practice in a certain situation and that you know what's going on. Um, and have you behaved reasonably? So falling short of perfection uh, isn't necessarily negligence. Okay, like everybody has a bad day and perfection than it, but it's whether it's a big falling short. Um, so what if somebody else in your position, with another architect in your position, have acted in the same way? Or did you deviate substantially from the accepted kind of standard procedure? Um, and we all make mistakes and we all, and that's fair enough, but was your error a judgment? Was it an unreasonable error? Did you do something completely off the wall? Or is it an error that somebody else might have made because there's just a small mistake? So what you've got to do is kind of minimize the possibility of mistake, okay? Um, so yeah, da, da, da. so another important thing here to remember is not to give advice in areas that you're not, you're not expected or you're not really able to. So although you should have a working knowledge with regards to the law of planning and building regulations and contracts and so on, certain areas should obviously, you should defer to an expert. So you might need to say, well, listen, we need to get a solicitor to deal with that. We need to get a planning expert to deal with this thing. Um, I can't talk to you about the electrical circuits in this house because I'm not an electrician. We need to get an electrician to talk about that. So make sure you're only giving um, opinion on things in which you're qualified to give opinion and don't stray outside your area of expertise. And then I guess coming to this managing your risk, again, it's only certifying works and things that you've been expected yourself and that you're happy with. Don't be bullied by contractors into signing certs or, or, cl or clients even into signing certs and certificates for certain things that you're not comfortable signing. And again, this all comes back to reputation. You only have one reputation. And if you find yourself being bullied into signing certificates and things by clients and contractors that you're not happy about, you shouldn't do it because again, it's your reputation at risk, not theirs, okay? And you should never put another colleague or in, in that situation either. You should never put them under pressure to do something that you wouldn't do yourself. Um, and as Sandra said, all this advice is available in the graduate area at the website. So if you log on, you'd be able to go into the good practice guide and see all these practice notes. So I'm gonna move on now and talk briefly about misconduct and poor professional performance. So this is the horrible side of, of the job, I guess, that there's always a little risk that this might happen. But professional misconduct is, is any act of mission or pattern of, um, any act of mission or pattern of conduct that constitutes a serious breach or falling short of the standards expected by the code of conduct or a series of breaches that could therefore be considered serious or any conduct connected to the profession of architecture or otherwise, which is disgraceful or dishonorable. And poor professional performance is defined as any failure of an architect to meet the standards of competence that may reasonably be expected of the architect practicing architecture. So we have this document called the Architect's Code of Conduct. I don't know whether you've seen it or not yet, but I think it does come into your course at some stage, you get to see it. But this sets out what's expected of architects since the Code of Conduct, and it's broken down into three areas, which are general obligations, obligations to employers. So your employers in this case are your clients and obligations to the profession. So the general obligations talk about things about acting honestly, acting with integrity, avoiding situations that cast out under independence or impartiality or integrity, um, not to act in a misleading manner, maintaining your independence, um, not representing, misrepresenting yourself or representing yourself in a misleading way. Um, uh, make sure you have a complaints process in your practice um, and that you have a primary duty to your client. But despite this primary duty to your client, you do also have to have a regard to the uh, to conserve and enhance the environment and everything around you. The duties to the employer or the client is about being professional, keeping them informed, acting in confidence, don't not abusing a position of privilege um, or abusing privileged information, um, disclosing any conflicts of interest, making sure you're competent by keeping up to date with your CPD and so on. 
um, making sure that everything is adequately adequately inspected and super and um, yeah, make sure everything ad adequately inspected. One of the most important things under this heading actually is to confirm in writing your terms and conditions of engagement. This is where a lot of disputes arise, where an architect hasn't clearly set out the scope of the job they're doing, what the payments for it's going to be, how the payments is going to be structured. Um, and this is quite often where the falling outs occur between architects and clients. And the RAI publish agreements, um, which help in this regard. And if you use those and stick to that format, you should be okay. Um, you also need to, in this area, inform clients when experts need to be appointed or engaged and agree the fee with those experts with the client. Make sure you have adequate professional indemnity insurance um, and carrying out your duties without delay. And one of the areas, another thing here obviously is a big area of complaint <clears throat> is a lack of communication. So it's very important to keep your communication lines open with the client, be clear, never, be, uh, never leave any ambiguity, never assume anything always have it written down exactly what it is that they want or that what it is that you're going to do. Um, making assumptions can lead to a lot of problems. Um, obligations to the profession. Again, this is about pursuing professional activities with independence and impartiality, um, uh, with honesty and fairness, maintaining your skills and your knowledge through CPD, not implying that you have skills that you don't have. Um, maintaining proper business structures. Another important thing, don't be given second opinions on other people's work, okay? Unless you're going to be acting as an expert in a court case or something, it's not a nice thing to do. Um, and yeah, it, it's just passing comments on other people's work isn't necessarily nice. Um, because uh, quite often you don't know what the brief behind it was. Um, so you're not commenting with full knowledge of what the situation is. Um, and then obviously never sign for any work that you're not responsible for or which you don't have control over. Um, so the code of conduct. So yeah, so the code of conduct, although it's written out and it's very prescriptive, it's more than just following the, the line by line of it. You need to kind of follow the spirit of it as well. Um, and then we get down to fitness to practice. So when somebody makes a complaint to the RAI about an architect, it goes into what's known as the fitness to practice process. Um, quite often we try to see people will mediate first um, to try and get a resolution, but not always is that possible. So the technical, or the professional conduct committee is chaired by a, a barrister, a solicitor, or a former circuit or Supreme Court judge, and it sits with a non-architect majority. So there's architects who are elected to the committee, but they form own the minority of the committee. Um, and they are elected every three years by architects. So every three years there's a ballot and people put their names forward to, to be on the professional conduct committee and all the registered architects get to vote for five people to sit with the seven non-architects on that committee. Um, sorry, there we go. Um, so, so yeah, so the PCC considers uh, concerns relating to the practice of architects in order to safeguard the public interest and maintain the reputation of architects of the architect's profession. And it does this by investigating actions of registered architects which are alleged to amount to poor professional performance or professional misconduct. So anybody can make a complaint. It doesn't have to be your client. It could be your client's next door neighbor because they think you're doing something wrong or you're encroaching on their premises or you've drawn boundary lines wrong or something like this. So it's not just your client. Um, and the PCC only makes decisions that relate to poor professional performance or professional misconduct. So there's certain things that they won't consider. Um, and also it's not a redress system. So it's not like an alternative to court. You're not there, uh, you can't be um, made pay compensation or damages to anybody. Um, and it's not like a court case where the client's on one side and you're on the other, it's an inquiry. So the registrar, so I'll get all the information and I'll present all the facts to the committee. You can then present, or the architect can then present what they think the facts are or cross-examine. And then the inquiry committee will then start asking questions and trying to work out from the facts presented whether or not the person has fallen below the acceptable standard or has breached the code of conduct. Um, and then finally, last slide now. <clears throat> so prohibition on the use of title architects. So I said at the very beginning, before 2008, anybody could call themselves an architect. Since 2008, only people on the register can call themselves an architect. Um, so, and there's, so the RAI has the power to bring these people to the district court and prosecute them when they misuse the title. Um, and so they can be fined up to 5,000 euro, or they can face up to 12 months in prison, or they can get both. 
So important things to remember in this regard for you guys is that when you receive your BARC, so currently you're an architectural student, so you can use that title. You can say, I'm an architectural student. When you get your BARC or your MARC, you can then say you're an architectural graduate. And when you pass your professional practice exam, you'll still be able to say you're an architectural graduate. It's only when you get on the register can you then start saying that you're a registered architect and use the title architect. And at that stage, you'll have your practice search and you can put it up on the wall and everybody will know that you've done your seven, eight, nine, ten years of study and theory and pain and partying and all the rest of it and you're out the other side and now you can go out and start getting paid and uh, doing great stuff. Okay, so that's the end of it there. So if you ever have any questions, um, you can contact me or Sandra or if you come to the stage where you're about to be admitted to the register, um, you can contact Antia and she'll help talk you through the process of registering and getting all your certificates and diplomas and stuff in order. So there we go. So any questions, we're ready now. Um, I'd just like to thank both Sandra and Frank for the two presentations that they gave us, um, particularly to kind of go through, I suppose, the education and then the professional side of being an architect. Um, I think in particular for younger students, it's not something we learn about until maybe fourth year. Um, something that we learned um, this year um, in a professional practice module. So it's really encouraging to allow, I suppose, more students within the school to, to learn these things earlier on, rather than finding out towards the end. Um, so now we can start the Q&A session. Um, I can start off with maybe a few questions of my own. Um, I know you mentioned about um, studying abroad and how it's quite difficult to, um, I suppose the whole transition between studying abroad and um, I suppose from your previous studies in Ireland. Um, but is this something that like we should probably encourage maybe in young architects, particularly because um, architecture is quite a universal language. Um, maybe it's maybe it's kind of an open discussion that I suppose you were saying about um, compiling a list of European countries um, who would facilitate that kind of like having that kind of list of European countries that have similar qualifications. Is this something that you think should start to be kind of encouraged to do? I think it's a great opportunity and um, actually I did it myself. I went and I, I uh, complete, participated in something that was similar enough to Erasmus, if you know about Erasmus, in South America, in Colombia, and but it was kind of an arrangement between our school and another school. But the thing about Erasmus is that you're still completing your, you're on the same, you're going to get the same award as, you know, from CCA, you say, at the end of the day, you're just kind of taking a break and going to another school and you, those schools, your school and that school have agreed that you're going to cover the learning outcomes that are required in the particular year. So I went to Columbia for fourth year and I have to say it was life changing. <laughs> it was a fantastic experience. So there is also Erasmus, obviously, that's an opportunity to, you know, if you, if you ask within your school. I suppose that, that, that the most of caution that we were, we were uh, sounding are more about where you're deciding to switch completely from school, one school to another. And we would really encourage, I think, um, study abroad. It, the thing that, uh, and Frank might talk more about this, is, you know, the EU is extremely accessible and the EU qualifications directive, rather than stinting people's um, mobility, it really encourages it. So you can, because there's a common standard, you can move easily between schools of architecture. There are just a couple of simple steps you need to follow. And that's really what we're saying, just watch out for those steps. But Frank will talk about uh, yeah. the UK and the EU. Sorry, Frank, are you on mute? Yeah, no, I was just going to say there's, there's two ways that you can move around the EU with your European qualifications. And there's, there's a system called automatic recognition. And automatic recognition means that where you get your five-year qualification and whatever postgraduate requirements you have, so in order of the professional practice exam from the one country, you're in a system called automatic recognition, which means when you go to another EU state, they can't look behind your qualifications or make you do any kind of compensation measures or do any other exams. The other system is known as a general system. And the general system is where you have your five years from one country and whatever postgraduate requirements from another country. So let's say you did your five years in Ireland and you went to Germany and did your two years postgraduate experience in Germany. Um, well, then you'd have what's known as a mixed qualification. You'd be in the general system. And that makes it a little bit more complicated to move around, but not much. But the easiest way to move around is definitely to have five years and two years from the one country or the five years in the postgraduate requirement. So what you could do, for instance, is do four years in CCAE 
move to Germany for the fifth year, have you finished your five years in Germany and then stay in Germany for two years, do your professional practice requirements there, which I think is two years professional practice experience, isn't it? There's no exam, it's just two years experience. And then you'd qualify in Germany and you'd have five years and two years all from Germany. So you'd be in the automatic system still. So it's just something to think about that if you move around, you kind of, it's good to maybe have a little, a slightly longer term view if you want to make things simple for yourself in future. So maybe move after fourth year and go somewhere for three, four years and do your professional, your, finish your five years and do your professional requirements in one country. But there's no problem splitting it between two. There's no problem having five years in Ireland and having the, the professional practice requirement from France or somewhere. Um, there's no, it's no biggie. It's a little bit more, a little bit more administration involved, but nothing insurmountable. Do you want to talk a little bit about the UK, Frank? Um, uh, yeah. So the UK, so the UK obviously isn't in the EU anymore, um, and so they aren't part of the professional qualifications directive anymore. So Ireland and the EU, we negotiated this memorandum of understanding which will be in place until the EU and the UK get a proper bigger agreement. But what it does, is it tries to maintain the status quo. So people who have already qualified in Ireland or the UK with the UK or Irish qualifications can still switch back and forth quite easily. Um, it, it will kind of apply to you guys because your qualification is listed in the directive. Uh, and if you were to get your professional practice exam in Ireland, you could easily move to the UK, it wouldn't be a problem. But if you did your five years in Ireland and then you decide to move to the UK to do the UK part three, well, then you'd have a bit of a problem moving around Europe because you'll have an EU five year qualification, which is recognized, but then you'll have a postgraduate qualification from a third country, which isn't an EU country. And that could cause lots of difficulties when you start trying to move around other EU countries to get work. Um, so yeah, it's probably better to, at a minimum, keep your qualifications within the EU, even if it's five years from one country and the postgraduate part from somewhere else. Um, but yeah, and that's what Sandra and I were saying earlier on. Like there are a lot of uh, courses around the EU, which are international kind of masters, which are taught through English. Um, so if you can search those out, if you want to go abroad, they could be the kind of things maybe to look for the alternative to go into the UK, which is where most people used to go. Um, so yeah, you need to kind of change your horizon slightly maybe. Yeah, thank you. That's that's perfect. That kind of, I suppose, encompasses everything. Because I, I think when you brought up Erasmus, um, that was quite an interesting topic because it's not really talked about within our college in particular. I know there's it was maybe like one or two people um, that went. I think one person in our year went. Um, but it's almost not really encouraged to go and anymore within like the architectural course which I think is a little bit disappointing because um you know as I mentioned before like architecture is quite a universal language and we go on field trips every year um bar this year because of COVID um so we we like to have that integration within other cultures and I suppose the only kind of similar thing would be the MRC where you do get to spend I think about two weeks in a country abroad on like as I said, it was very different this year. Um, I mean, there's no way yeah. we can change that. I but very, yeah, I'm not sure. People in Erasmus must be doing it from their own home. <laughs> and you could, I'm sure. But um, just to say that and the other thing that made it easier um, when I was in college, which is over 20 years ago, I was in um, Bolton Street, in, uh, which is to UW now. And uh, I did Erasmus um, in fourth year. So things have changed now. It's been much more difficult to do Erasmus in the year where you're going to get a, getting an award. So I suppose it might be that third year might be the, the, the time. Flip. And I would suggest just asking, because it might be that the school are dealing with so many different queries and things that they have to cover that they, they don't have somebody who's, who's ready and available to suggest that people would take Erasmus. But it might be an option. You know, I haven't heard anybody say it's not an option. And it does come up in visiting board reports from time to time that students are on Erasmus and the visiting boards would, our visiting boards would track how that's all going and, you know, where people, you know, coming back and successfully then completing the programme and that they're maintaining the standard. So, you know, there's probably somebody, there would certainly be an office in, in one of the universities that would um, support Erasmus. So you might be able to seek out those opportunities yourself and maybe consider it in third year. Obviously, it's worth talking to the management of the school, but just, you know. 
could be an option. Yeah, no, that, that's actually a really good um, option to give. And I think in particular, it's good to mention it here um, because as I mentioned, this will be, I suppose, applies to not just the fourth years, but also to younger years. And it's when uh, it'll come into play because I know third year is generally the year they think of going on Erasmus for us. I think the four and the one break can kind of like, make it a little bit difficult, but I find as well that the four and one, now that other universities are in, along like Ireland are looking at the four one module, it's it's kind of, in, it's quite encouraging for us to even look at um, maybe within Ireland where we could finish our education. Um, so like, I'm, I'm very encouraging at that anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know if um, Claire or Martin have any questions themselves. So, well, I know it's a while away till we'll be doing this, but um, for people who do want to move outside the EU, like it's big scary, but like, what do you do? Like if you want to move and practice in America, how much of a change is there? Like what's involved? Yeah, so the first thing I guess is that you need to get recognized in those countries. Um, and at the moment, the only one that we have an agreement kind of in the pipeline with is Canada. And you might hear people talking in the news about CETA the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement with Canada. So it has to be ratified by all the EU member states now in the next couple of months. Um, so there's a section in that on uh, mutual recognition of qualifications and uh, the European Commission. So the, the RAI is part of an organization called ACE, which is the Architects Council of Europe. And we were in discussions with them about what we would need to have a, an agreement with Canada. And so we agreed that and that went to the European Commission. The European Commission agreed that with our counterparts in Canada and we're waiting for that to be voted on. So in a couple, by the time you guys get out of college, there should be something there for Canada, hopefully. But the other countries, there, isn't, there aren't any uh, mutual recognition agreements with. So what you need to do is you go to the, the local uh, governing authority in that country, be it New Zealand or the United States or wherever, and they'll ask you to fill in, um, uh, what, list what your qualifications are. And they might do some kind of assessment to make sure it matches their standard. And in most cases, a European qualification will match up to those countries' requirements. But unfortunately, yeah, there's no mutual recognition agreement with third countries really at the moment. Um, so yeah, so it's uh, there's no kind of click and go scenario. Um, you have to kind of apply to the local competent authority or the local registration body. Yeah. So it varies country to country. And the okay, EU are perfect. always developing new ones. Isn't there something with Mexico in the pipeline, but it's probably a good way off. So, you know, there are individual agreements being developed with the EU. But yeah, so it, it depends. Like when the EU goes out and starts putting together kind of trade agreements with different countries, some of them might have a section for mutual recognition of qualifications. And so if there are, we'll find out about it. But Canada is the first one that I know of. Um, and one that we've been working on. And now we've obviously, we're starting to work on one for the UK with the whole of the EU, not just Ireland. So they're, they're becoming more common. Perfect, thank you. It, it, would it be worth saying as well that if you decide, or say a student decides to move to the US or somewhere to complete their studies, there are recognition systems within the RAI to recognize um, third country applicants. So, yeah. So if you went and studied outside of Ireland <clears throat> or outside of the EU, um, when you came back, there, there, there are routes into registration for people from a, who have known as a third country. So not an EU country or not Ireland. So you come in this third country route and your qualification would be assessed. So what would happen is, that you would present to the RAI the, um, the course module and descriptors and everything and all the modules that you did. And they'd be assessed against the RAI standard and the article 46 of the directive to make sure you meet the European standard. And it might be a paper exercise. It might be really straightforward that, yeah, this meets the standard. Or if there's a query, you might be then called for an interview on certain points. And then once it's been established that it's equivalent um, well, then you can register in Ireland. And if you're an EU citizen, there's a provision in the Act that if, if Ireland were to recognise that and you were to practise in Ireland for three years, I think it is, that you could then, it would then turn into an automatic European qualification for the purposes of recognition. 
So you could then, it then becomes, you, you then get into that automatic recognition system. Um, so there are pathways in, but um, I don't know going the other way. If you're going from Ireland to the States, I'm not sure. That makes sense, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Any worries about? Yeah, sorry. All questions I had have been answered, so I'm all right. <laughs> well, what were they? We might be able to kind of expand on them a bit more. Were they, what were areas were you thinking of? Well, I was going to ask about um, outside of the EU as well, uh, the same okay. as Claire just asked, so that's perfect. And um, yeah, that's really what I had. Okay. Yeah. And anybody have any queries about practice and starting practice and what their kind of expectations are about their first day on the job? Um, that kind of stuff, no? I think, yeah, I think um, particularly now we're in fourth year, um, COVID has been like a big kind of issue for us when it comes to like, one, even just finding jobs that'll take students like us. Like they wouldn't have met us in person. So it's quite hard to gauge even like what our body of work looks like with ourselves, um, which which shouldn't, it shouldn't be a, a thing where you need to see someone, but it, it's good for contact wise. Um, I think that's a big issue for us at the moment is that whole, like, do we go straight into practice? Do we start working? Like, it's 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 a big question. And I think it's just been intensified by COVID. Um, yeah, so, so how, are you guys dealing, how are you guys dealing with this? So fourth year, you take a year off before you go into your master's. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's what's been advised. Can't... It's yeah. not necessarily like um, some people would like to go straight in uh, for a master's, particularly with. Um, the unknown situation we have right now and there is um, I think we were informed recently the process for us to go straight in um, it's still a little bit hazy I think um, if we wanted to go straight into CCE but, but is um, there a worry you're not going to be able to get work if you were to take that year off what's the point of taking it off yeah, yeah. so I don't know Amanda, have we yeah. spoken to practices about are they kind of giving work experience remotely is that possible Mentioned there on our job search page we have a list of practices who might be interested in hiring people on a year out and at the moment you're probably going to be working from home uh you know until potentially september october anyway so you know it's worth worth contacting practices to ask them even if they're not based near you would you be able to work remotely with them because everybody's better set up for working remotely so you could be assisting a practice in dublin or a practice in some other part of the, the country you know and gaining that experience and i think it's just it's worth asking the list is there now it's 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 small enough at the moment um but carol who my colleague who compiles it is receiving more queries now on a daily basis because people are starting practices are starting to think about it again you know and there are practices who just always have a rolling they have a student working with them constantly so that student as that student moves on each year they need to consider the next year and what they're going to do and now is around the time they will so i think it's well worth just checking it out before you decide whether you're going to go straight on or not just put the feelers out and see what practices are are saying you know and the other thing is to keep an eye for, as again, for if you've completed your fifth year or if you're about to the fifth year, to keep an eye on those graduate schemes and maybe to consider applying for them now because they, as I said, they're a great opportunity. And those kind of organizations will, I would say, be working from home for quite a while yet. You know, the larger ones are really, you know, they have to be very careful about how they, they, they have to plan well in advance. So they will be planning to work remotely for a while. So um, that would give a little bit further flexibility um, there's one thing I just wanted to mention, actually, Frank mentioned about the title that you can use when you qualify from the EMARC, but it's important to note that the, the title you can use when you qualify from the BSc ARC is architecture student, because I do see students from, our, from CCAE saying I'm a, I'm a, I think it's just, I can't remember the exact term, but they may, may have called themselves a graduate. And in fact, you're not actually an architectural graduate at that point because you haven't completed your five years of architectural education. So you're still a student. And in, in, in the, the path to registration, you're taking a year out, even though you've graduated from that program. So it's just uh, important to note that when you are contacting firms and that. But I would say, give it a go, see what's happened because there's a lot going on out there practices are thinking about different ways of working and they definitely need students there's a role for students in practices and there are a lot of firms out there who will give you good support and you know really give you good guidance when you're um, and, and experience before you you head into the mark 
I think what you were mentioning about like other firms around Ireland um, kind of opening up because we've had to work from home, it gives us more of an opportunity. I think that's quite an interesting topic to bring up because it wouldn't have been a possibility this time last year, I don't think, because we were only just like getting used to the whole situation. And I think that's what's quite helpful is that like we wouldn't necessarily have to move up to Dublin, which, you know, is, is quite expensive to do that, particularly when you're a qualified student who wouldn't maybe have the funds to I suppose afford like housing at the moment up there so I think that's quite an interesting um, and like a good thing to think about when applying for places that you're not just stuck to your own county you can move yeah. along. And the other thing to remember is that your year out is, is although it's a requirement by CCAE it's not a requirement by the RAI for registration so it's good it would be good to talk to CCAE about whether you could work for somebody abroad because I'm nice talking to a colleague who works in London runs an office in London and he said he just hired somebody from Canada and he's delighted with the graduate he's hired from Canada because the skills they have are amazing he's never going to have that person in his office he's going to work in for Canada full-time so you could gain experience in a different country as well if CCAE allow that I don't know their rules in terms of what you're you know your, whether they have any rules about your year out and the experience you have to get but you could gain some really interesting experience from working here you know I think everybody in work and Frank and I would be the same the way we work has changed completely the way we deliver what we do has changed completely in the last year totally transformed and if you said to us a year ago you're going to be doing everything online and you're going to be working fully from home we would have laughed you know there's no way it would have taken us years to plan it but that's where everybody is now so even if uh, offices do return to to their or companies do return to their offices they'll still have a different way of working and they may, particularly with a student where they're looking for a particular type of input and skill, they may be happy to have you work remotely. You know, you're bringing a huge amount of knowledge of programs that they, they may not be able to use, particularly the graphic using that. And, you know, you, there's lots of roles that you could take on that you could do remotely. So I would, it's a huge benefit to get exposure to practice. And that's something we're talking about in the RAI a lot at the moment about the exposure the students get when they take a year out. So I would encourage it. And if you can get it, do try to get it. Thank you. A quick um, question about the year out, just a second, just a small bit, just like why it doesn't count then towards the two years. Is it because you don't have the five year study already finished? Okay. It's a standard in Europe that um, most professional, most uh, competent authorities and most states require you to have postgraduate experience. So we're pretty, so you, the UK is the only one that allows, and, and now it's not the EU, um, it allows students to complete one year between their part. Um, to one and part two and then they do one year post-graduation but in all other states we're, we're more consistent with the rest of Europe that we require two years post-graduate it was debated uh, a number of years ago when the education policy was reviewed and council actually the RAI council which is the board which decides on policy actually recommended that it should be three years <laughs> or had a conversation and we're about to recommend it should be three years post-graduate so and then they left that too and in the likes of Poland you have to do uh, three years and one of those has to be on site actually out in your boots and hard hat and I think what you learn from that would be amazing um but you know so we if you put it in the context it, we're very often comparing compared to the UK but in fact our we're pro probably more medium um um we have a more medium level policy in comparison to other states but it's something that's constantly debated it's being debated at the minute and it's something that may change in the next few years who knows so it's not that it's you know that's the situation and we're never going to change it it constantly comes up with the board of architecture education and we're actually reviewing the we're going to be reviewing this education standards um over the next few months and that will be a hot topic so again if we come to you and we're looking for people to join forums or discussion groups about these things if you're interested please do get involved because we really need to hear the student voice in these things okay hope that answers the question definitely thank you um, I'm not too sure if we have any more questions, but I think it's a good time to wrap up. Um, we've got five minutes left on this meeting anyway, so it's great timing. Um, I'd just like to thank you again, um, both Frank and Sandra, for delivering um, the lecture and also a very informative Q&A session. I'd like to thank as well Martin and Claire and myself as well from UC Architecture Society um, just for, I suppose, partaking in this. And I think it's, I suppose, it's great that we can have this now um, as a record and something to refer back to um, and something to listen to while we're working as well. It's good to have that kind of 
it's one thing that I quite like about this whole um, what happened with COVID is being able to produce these lecture series um, for ourselves and for other students. Um, so thank you. Thank you Thanks very much for the opportunity to talk. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you.